Hi everyone, um, I'm Susie Russell, I'm the Network Coordinator of the Community Support of the Agriculture Network UK and uh, thanks for joining us for this session on Unlocking Land for CSA in the North of England. We've got with us, we should have had four amazing expert people but we've got three because unfortunately Helen from the Kindling Trust hasn't been able to make it today. So we've got Kate Swade who's Shared Assets Co-Exec Director with over 15 years experience 15 years of experience helping local authorities and communities collaborate in stewardship of their environments and neighbourhoods and she's designed and delivered qualitative and quantitative research projects at a variety of levels and is also an experienced trainer and facilitator. Um, she works across all of Shared Assets work which includes policy research, consultancy and advocacy and leads on organisational development and culture. And then we've got Graham who's the farming lead in rural economy and communities at CPRE. Uh, he joined CPRE in 2006 and launched their Tranquility and Intrusion Maps and then he's managed research on local food webs across England. He's written on farm diversity, loss of smaller farms and agroecological management of soils and at the moment he's working on county farms and changing land use to address the climate emergency. We've got and he grew up in Cheshire where he regularly worked on family farms. Um, we would have had Helen, a founding member of Greater Manchester's Kindling Trust, which is working to create a fairer and more sustainable food system for Manchester and beyond. And over the last 13 years, Helen's helped to establish Kindling's practical initiatives, which include their Farm Start programme, which is encouraging and supporting a new generation of organic growers, Woodbank Community Food Hub and Kindling sister cooperatives, Manchester Veg People and Veg Box People, which are both aimed at creating fairer markets for organic growers and making local organic food accessible to all. She's currently focusing on establishing Kindling Farm, which is a hundred plus acre organic agroforestry farm for the Northwest. And then we've got Guy Shrubshull, who's an environmental campaigner and author of Who Owns England, a book that delves into the secrecy surrounding land ownership, why it's so unequal and why that matters for how we use land. And he recently helped co-author a report called Reviving County Farms with the, the New Economics Foundation, Shared Assets and CPRE. And he's currently campaigning to get a ban on moorland burning by grouse moor estates, coax landowners into investing more in natural climate solutions and extend the right to roam. So I'll just start by giving you a brief introduction to CSA for those of you that don't know what it is or have a sort of blurred idea of what it is. So CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. Started in Japan um, and it's very big in Japan, France and the US, but pretty global. There's urgency as the global network for CSA. Um, it's, it's a veg box or meat box scheme and more. So it's not just about shorter supply chains, fresh local food and healthy seasonal produce. It's also about connecting people and producers, relying on collaboration and commitment within a mutually supportive partnership and sharing the responsibilities, risks and rewards of farming. So you're not just, it's not just a marketplace transaction. You don't just give money and get something in return. You're actually investing in the place that's producing your food which, which means you have a much better idea of how, how much it takes to, make, to produce food and what goes into the production of your food. You know where it comes from, you know what's gone into it, you know the people growing it. So people growing or farming as CSA farms have a guaranteed market and a steady income. So CSAs, the most common model would be that you pay up front um, for a whole season of produce, which means that as opposed to the kind of real vagaries of producing for supermarkets where you never know whether your produce is going to get bought or not from one week to the next, you get paid months afterwards. A CSA producer will know from the beginning of the season how many people they're growing for. And so they've got a, a, an amount of income which they can spend and they know exactly what they've got to produce. So there's minimum waste. They develop really strong connections with the local community and it's very transparent. You know exactly what and how your food is, is produced. And members of CSAs, so the customers or members, um, have a regular supply of fresh produce coming in minimum packaging, a strong connection with the people producing their food, and they know exactly where their food comes from. So at the network, we have, we estimate around uh, 200 CSAs across the UK. 
I say estimate because we have around 150 members in our network, but we know there are a fair few farms operating on a CSA model who aren't members. Um, we, our aim, our vision ultimately is for a CSA in every neighbourhood as part of an ecology of sustainable agroecological food for everyone in the UK. And the work we do, we bring CSAs together, we promote and raise awareness of CSA, um, we represent CSA to policymakers um, and link in with other organisations like Shared Assets, LWA, Sustain, Urgency, the Organic Growers Alliance, and we support new and existing CSAs through provision of training, resources, uh, mentoring, webinars and events. So that's a brief introduction to CSA and I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Guy, to give us a background to land ownership in the, in, well, the UK and the north of England. So thanks, Guy. Thanks, Dizzy. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can see some slides. Um, let's try that. So hopefully you can see just the slides. Is that right? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. So yeah, um, my name's Guy. I, I, I'm an environmental campaigner um, and I wrote this book last year called Who Owns England? Um, and it's about obviously land ownership, particularly in England. Um, but uh, I guess there is also observations about land ownership in, in Scotland where things are quite different. Um, but uh, what I want to just talk about in um, this presentation is Obviously, one aspect of, of getting access to land for food growing is, uh, is tied up in who owns land currently. Uh, and land ownership in England is very unequal. Um, my best estimate is that less than 1% of the population own half of all England. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that hasn't changed for quite a long time. So if we look at this next slide, um, this shows you um, the you know, series of series of calculations and estimates um, that I talk about in in my book about how uh, how that uh, land ownership mostly breaks down. So um, actually, a lot of land is still owned by the aristocracy and gentry who have owned land for centuries. Indeed, some of them have owned their families have owned land going all the way back to the Norman Conquest. Um, uh, 18% of land thereabouts in England is owned by corporations. So that's a sort of more recent development. So since the Victorian period, since um, corporations have, and companies have sort of developed, they've sort of gobbled up more land. Some of that's housing developers, some of that's mining companies. Some of that could indeed be agribusinesses as well. Um, and, you know, you, you look at this and you, this breakdown, and you can see that actually when it comes to talking about homeowners, um, despite there being, you know, 17 million homeowners or thereabouts, um, actually that, uh, that's only about 5% of the land in England that comprises uh, homes and gardens. So um, we can see here that you know, home own uh, land ownership in England is, is very unequal. Um, huge amounts of, of rural land and urban land are owned by a very small number of people. Uh, and so I guess that starts to create a, a bit of a challenge when it comes to thinking about how we, how we access land, um, uh, and, and questioning about who, who uh, how, how currently uh, that land is used. I just wanted to give you a, a one example um, from the very soft southern uh, county that I grew up in of, of West Berkshire, um, of how that concentration of land ownership can look on the ground. So this is a map of land ownership in, in West Berkshire. It gives you, uh, it shows you all these different colours, uh, the, uh, the different estates, um, and just 30 of those landowners own nearly half of that county. So you can get, start to get a sense of, of how the kind of landscape is divided up uh, in a place like West Berkshire. And it's not uh, unique. It's certainly replicated across many counties that I've seen uh, similar maps for, um, where um, you know, a, a small number of people own a lot of that rural land surrounding um, the towns and cities. In fact, the largest landowner in West Berkshire is its former MP, uh, Richard Bennion, um, which I think was quite interesting as well to sort of show how uh, land and the ownership of land also uh, has a, has considerable overlap with uh, continuing kind of power influence on our political system, and so that's that's uh, another thing that I kind of try to talk about in the book. Um, I wanted to show you this map as well, which is a map of England's top ten institutional landowners. Um, this is obviously spread across the country. Um, perhaps it might look as if actually they don't own a huge amount of land, um, 
but in fact, because there's obviously a lot of grey area here, which is which is not owned by them, but overall they still own about 2.3 million acres of land, which is 7% of the country. Um, and you've got obviously the Forestry Commission, National Trust, MOD, uh, much of the land uh, that they own, particularly the Forestry Commission, is is not going to be farmland or is certainly not being currently farmed. It's obviously under, under forest. Um, much MOD land is is sort of in the uplands or as well, or you know, tra training uh, centres or places that you know um, is not necessarily uh, hugely actively farmed. Some of it may be uh, lightly grazed, um, and obviously a lot of this land by uh, owned by organisations like the RSPB uh, and the National Trust comprises you know kind of precious habitats that uh, wouldn't be kind of appropriate to be um, being used for sort of you know large amounts of farming but but equally this the, these top 10 institutional landowners do include um organizations like the Church of cornwall and the church commissioners who do own a lot of farmland and are actively farming uh, on it and uh, and leasing it to, to many tenants so there's there's uh, i think interesting conversations there about what's what role is being played by those kind of these basically these pillars of the establishment um who've owned land for for many hundreds and if not a thousand years um and uh and, and what is being done to, you know, support tenants on these um, on these land holdings? You know, are they being encouraged to, you know, do things like agroecology, or are they being allowed to innovate in ways they want to? Um, or indeed, are they? Are there, aren't, is there a kind of um, turnover of tenants that allows, um, you know, smaller growers to graduate onto um, accessing more farmland that way? If you want to. Kind of have a little round and just get more into this. I've got an interactive map um, which I've built with a brilliant coder, Hal Smith, um, and it's accessible at map.hewensengland.org. Um, so you can actually kind of dig into land ownership in your area a bit more and start to perhaps see a bit more about who owns uh, your local area. Um, obviously, the map is very incomplete, so it definitely needs a lot of work from lots of people to input to who owns land uh, in England. It's still a very big secret in many regards. The land registry is, is not an open book uh, and it's locked up behind a paywall so it's very difficult to find out often who owns land in an area without having to pay quite a lot of money to the land registry to, to get that information so I've been trying to um, work with others to, to map it in other ways um, but we might want to talk more about sort of accessing information about land ownership later but I just wanted to uh, wrap up with two slides because one of the ways in which um, historically uh, uh, people in England have tried to, and governments as well, have tried to kind of push back against some of this concentration of land ownership in the hands of very few uh, landowners is, um, is county farms. And Graham will talk much more about this in uh, next, but county farms really started in the late 19th century as an idea to kind of uh, enfranchise more, uh, more farmers, more, more people without uh, access to land. Um, the phrase three acres and a cow originates from the the late 19th century when there were calls for agricultural um, and land reform um, and there was this growth in county farms as councils were given the powers to, uh, to and, and, and the budgets to be able to buy up land to be able to then lease out as, as what became known as county farms so they were intended as a way to kind of create land and access to land for, for smaller farmers and you can see there was a, there was a meteoric rise in the um, first bit of the, of the 20th century, uh, first quarter of the 20th century um, really kind of peaked around World War II, um, sort of obviously links there with things like greater national self-sufficiency in food and dig for victory and so on. But then since the late 1970s, there's been a really precipitous decline in the area of county farms. They've halved in area, uh, and so we're left with 200,000 acres uh, across England today. But I wanted to end on a slightly more optimistic note, which is that that, that is still a huge amount of land. 200,000 acres is, is a vast area. Uh, in total, and this map just shows you the counties colour in red show you every uh, council that uh, and county that still owns uh, a county farms estate of whatever size. Um, so they are still widespread across England um, and um, you know, are, are still doing a really valuable job uh, of, of giving access to land for sometimes first time farmers or allowing farmers to continue to, to operate if they don't have you know, the kind of ability to access. Uh, lots of private capital and 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 invest in land themselves. So, um, I'm sure I'm sure Graham's going to talk a lot more about their benefits and the challenges facing county farms. So I'll wrap up there. Great. Should I carry on, Susie? Or Susie, you're on mute. I think. 
yes, sorry, I was just fiddling around with the mute button. <laughs> thanks, Guy, and yeah, take over, Graham. Right, uh, thanks, Guy. And I, I think what struck me from what you're saying there, Guy, is the kind of stratification of land ownership, but how, and as you said at the end, how important the public sector is. I mean, so you showed the graph there of the drop in county farms, and I think we know from the work you did last year with Kate, Kim, which had assets, that um, you know part of that is privatization from the 1980s but also the austerity agenda so there is there is an issue about the sort of decline further decline in the public sector but i still think lots of opportunity so i was going to talk really a bit more about county farms and smallholders as guys said talk about their relevance in the north of england you've seen guys great slide there and then something of the current context and then what perhaps local authorities could be doing with their estates. So, um, so we've had some of the history and I think it's um, picking up on where Guy left off in terms of where we are now. You've seen that decline over the last few decades because of austerity. And it's a bit of a postcode lottery. I mean, I think you've got um, probably some more decline in the North than in the South. Um, but as Guy said, that land holding remains really significant, especially as we say of a lot of other land is in private ownership and across the country it's um it's got real value as a national asset that we want to hang on to and make work better for local communities so in terms of some numbers i'm not doing slides by the way so i'm just gonna gonna talk to you um there are about 2,000 county farms across england um about 2,000 tenants and those have some lifetime ranging from lifetime tenancies to um five years or less and, and sort of annual leases on grazing and so forth they are of varying sizes, but the average size um, is around 80 acres, so they are small holdings. And there are many different types of farms, and that will depend on the area of the country. So they can be arable, dairy, mixed livestock, general, and horticulture. So, and horticulture may well be an area we're looking at with CSAs and the opportunities. Um, but what they aren't, I think, is, and at the risk of confusing you all, is they're not just owned by county councils so um and, and guys done far more work on this than me but of course they were called county farms or county small holdings but they're now owned by the various types of councils there are there are unitary councils there are district and borough councils and if you take the north of england so there are county farms you probably saw in the map in cumbria and the classic counties of cumbria and north yorkshire but they're all in places like unitary authorities like cheshire east and west which were on the map and then boroughs like Hartlepool and York. So, and secondly, to add further to that confusion, there are other, that, the, the list that Guy's got there, and we've worked with, with Guy last year, and in the report he mentioned, actually comes from annual reports to Parliament, which are, come from the uh, Institute of Public Accountants and come from the councils and go to, into Parliament and, and just sit there and no one does anything with them, sadly, with those reports. But they do tell us something of the state of play. What they don't tell us is all the other land available so we've got a sort of murky picture still and guys doing brilliant work to um, open that up um, of, of who owns all the land in public in the public sector so Eastbourne for example isn't in that list on the report that goes to Parliament but has over 4,000 acres of public land which actually is farmed out and guys also done some work for us last year which shows that there's a real anomaly in some local authorities which have thousands of acres of land um, and that might be Leeds City or Bradford, for example. But actually, they don't let any of that as farmland, but they are getting subsidy from the Common Agricultural Policy, which normally would go to farming uh, as a direct payment, and it could be agro-environment payment. So there is a kind of need to open up where that land is and what it's being used for to help us to be able to engage with the issues. So, um, so are these, is this county land relevant to, to all of you who are interested in the north? And, uh, and as, as uh, Susie said, I'm, I'm from Cheshire, and I'm counting that as the north for these purposes. I hope that's okay. Um, yeah, well, I think it's important thinking about these council farms, let's call them for simplicity, given what I've just said, or small holding authorities. The unit in the north, there, as I said, there's North Yorkshire, there's the East Riding of Yorkshire, which have large land holdings still. There are places like Nottinghamshire, which I'm going to lump into this, Cheshire, East and West, the Cumbria, Durham, Hartlepool, York, and so forth, and other landholds you may not know about. So there are opportunities, but I think the real challenge is these overall represent about 10% of national estates, so there's kind of waiting towards the south. And historically, large holdings have been lost in counties like Lancashire and Northumberland, so it's a bit patchy in the north. And despite their, um, you know, their original purposes of supporting access to land for the landless and for new tenants on lower rents. Actually, 
um, there is too little movement in the tenancies on those farms. So they themselves have been sort of victims of the success and people have stayed on the farms and have lifetime tenancies and don't move, which means there are fewer opportunities than there should be. Um, so there are new tenancies about 40 or 50 a year that's declined, but there are new ones, so they're worth looking into, but we need to find ways to open up new tenancies and also need to find ways to use this land for being, for being managed for multiple purposes, I think, for new entrants and for the wider purposes that Guy was talking about for, for addressing other things, problems like climate change, access to nature and so forth. So um, I think we need to think about what, um, what we can do about this and what we are actively doing. Kate, myself, Guy, we're in a project where we're actually um, looking to revitalize what county farms do and what they can be used for. And the report was mentioned, came out last December, and we had three recommendations in that. The first was that the government needs to protect county farms better and keep those land holdings and repurpose them to wider social and environmental purposes, as well as open up for new, more new entrants. And we asked the government to invest in the enhanced county farms so that um, they can provide more opportunities for new people to get into farming and food growing. And thirdly, that local authorities should do a better job of promoting them and saying why they matter and all the things they could do to help their local community. So the second of those, um, the government has actually signed up to do. In February, it announced in a policy statement on farming, it was going to invest in setting up a new fund to enhance council farms and to open up new opportunities. Um, now, we don't know that much about that fund at the moment, but it is an opportunity that councils could seize upon to recognise what their family can do and then invest in a positive way in that land. And I'd just like to mention three big things, I think, which make this an interesting time and perhaps a challenging time, but also one with opportunity. So I think we know that austerity was effectively, in terms of political rhetoric, buried last year, um, end of austerity and all that. But now, of course, we're facing potentially a new wave of austerity. So that could mean councils and certainly the government gets trapped for cash once we get beyond the wave of dealing with COVID. And so I think councils need to be really clear what their attitude is to their assets and particularly their land in that context. Um, there are big changes going on in farming. I farming policy and I work with the new environmental land manager scheme and a lot of those farming those policies are going to change radically what farming is and what it looks like I think and there's a lot of this is linked to Brexit and potential trade deals and it does mean what the future of farm incomes look like and how people will farm for um, and what for will change and this is just starting with the transition but that does raise really interesting questions about you know what farming will have to become and how local, um, the, the county farm estates adapt to that and, and what new models can actually make for sustainable viable farming on that county land. And thirdly, of course, we're, we're facing, we know the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis are, are becoming more and more prominent, plus COVID, which may or may not last for years. But all those, I think, are causing people to rethink what's possible. And while there are difficulties, I think it's also a time when, um, you know, maybe of pivotal change that councils themselves will rethink what they're doing or what they're trying to achieve. Um, so I'd like to suggest there are a number of things that need to change and that will help uh, push this agenda forward. Um, I think in that difficult context there's a need for a change in mindset in local authorities and being realistic and I think Kate and, and I may know far more about it than myself about local authorities and how they think but some of the work we've done already shows that we have an issue with councillors. They may not understand their land holdings and the value of them for wider usage. Uh, and we need to be informing them and, and helping them to understand how important these assets are so they can be retained. Um, that may be a job we have to do as part of our project. Secondly, in terms of who holds the power, CEOs and directors of finances in local authorities um, are, do have power. And they see, in some authorities, will see this land as a financial asset only, which can be sold off um, to plug holes in the budget. And, and we faced this in a, we, I was involved in the Tregadugan County Farm. We were battling to save a farm in Wales. And we couldn't save it from the directors of finance who wanted to sell it off to the highest bidder, despite massive bids from the local community and lots of brilliant work done by people there. So there is a real challenge in changing the mindset of those people. And thirdly, councils, and we found this in the work that the guy and Kate did, that actually councils may not see that as their job anymore to provide this land. Uh, they may see it as an outmoded thing, and that's something we have to change because 
land I think is a great opportunity to do wonderful things for people and we see land differently. So I think councils need to, we, if we can change that mindset and we can develop a different view in councils about how progressive farming can be, how progressive land use can be, and how there are new things happening in terms of sustainability and the viability of farms and new ways to farm, including cooperative models like CSAs, then I think, and more holistic models and multifunctional views of land use, which is in help, help by things like the new environmental land management scheme that the government is putting forward. And I think if we could change mindsets, there's an opportunity to get local authorities to develop new plans and strategies for their land holdings. Um, and I think that means getting them to think more creatively about what the land could be used for and how it's used and opening up access. I think part of that needs to be guys agenda of opening up registers of what land holdings they have. It's very hard to engage democratically with local authorities when we don't know what land they have and therefore how can we be consulted on what it should be used for and we do need the public to be consulted on that in communities and decide what they want and citizens assemblies are great examples of how that might be done. And thirdly I think the council should engage with the government on these issues I think really with on and on this new fund we don't know enough about it but I think it's a real opportunity for local authorities to think how they could restructure their farms they could divide them not just think of consolidating them into sort of because of economies of scale and because actually small-scale horticulture people like Rebecca Lord have shown can be more economically viable they're not subsidized by cap and we've got to still persuade councils that is actually an economically viable, socially valuable, environmentally sustainable model of farming to go forward and not just big scale farming selling to the market, as Susie was saying earlier on. So, so there's a job to do to, to, to persuade councils of this, but I think that new fund could support some really innovative stuff and councils need to tap into that. So I think there are opportunities for people here to talk to local authorities and engage with their councillors. I know that's a hard job to do, but I mean, just to wrap up, really, it is a pivotal moment. We're at risk of losing farmland from councils, but there's also an opportunity to tap into these new funds and use the sort of current zeitgeist and reflection and change and this kind of pivotal moment to test, I think, and challenge local and national government about the decisions it makes. There's been huge failures in the past, but now I think is the time to reference things like climate change, nature restoration, but also equity. If levelling up is to mean anything, it should be equity of opportunity, and part of that should be opportunity towards access to land as part of what public authorities do with their land. I'll leave it there and look forward to the conversation and discussion. Thanks, Graham. That was that was great, really interesting. I wonder if um if you've got links to kind of where people can find that kind of information or any resources people can use when they're talking to local authorities and that would be great to put in chat to just share. Susan, so, we, yeah, Kate will mention that, I'm sure. We will. They're in my thing, don't worry. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so I'm, I, Helen, Helen couldn't make it today, but she just sent me some notes on what she was going to talk about. So I'm going to do a very bad job probably of just sharing a bit of what Helen from the Kindling Trust was going to talk about. So. We'd asked her to be part of, of this conversation because of her experience of actually accessing land for small scale farming in the north of England. So the Kindling Trust is in Manchester. Um, Helen was going to talk about the fact that they'd, they'd access land in three ways. Um, they'd access land through private, uh, private organic farmers where they rented two acres. They'd access land through local authorities. It's park and ex nursery land. And more recently, they've been looking for larger scale farmland for their kindling farm plans which is a 100 acre farm so they've been looking out on the open market she was she wanted to say that the first two were relatively straightforward in to find land from a private organic farmer they emailed all the farmers that they'd worked with through manchester veg people who buy veg from local organic farmers and sell it into the center of manchester and one of those farmers said yes straight away they had two acres that they would rent um, the second, they were looking for a site for Farm Start, which is their um, grower training program. Um, and they were offered quite a few sites by the local authority. The initial ones weren't suitable, um, but they eventually found one. And then the third, which was looking on the open market, has been a longer process. And, and she wanted to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities at, that she sees in that. So the things that she has sort of identified as challenges um, are location and current use. So you need to be able to get there easily 
and and if it's land that's in use by a current community for something they you might not necessarily be welcome so have a look at what the land is being used for now have a look at where it is and how you can get there and how other people can get there look at what shape the site's in is it any good for growing so the soil the aspect is it hilly is it exposed um if you're renting can you plant windbreaks for instance what's your what's your tenancy like if it's five years are you going to get a windbreak that's that's worth anything um, are you actually allowed to do that the infrastructure on the land so is there any access to water to storage to toilets um, certainly if you were running a CSA and were wanting a model where people came and volunteered and picked up their shares on the land you need to think about where people how people are going to get there is there a bus can they bike if they're going to come in a car is there somewhere to park are you going to annoy the neighbors because they suddenly have loads of cars or people turning up one day a week um finances how much money you have to put infrastructure into place and and if not um how are you going to find that money uh finances for buying so have you got that finance in place in time to buy on the open market um and it's really she she said it's really useful to be networked into the farming community to know what's on offer um and then she said it takes time so it's it they they found it really useful that they had credibility and a track record and that they that track record was really with farmers so they were known by farmers they were known as a kind of a proper farmer not a not a, a hobby farmer i guess and and so they were more likely to be able to to find land and then some of the opportunities she wanted to talk about were um if you want to rent there are lots of farms that aren't fully under production so um in their experience approaching farmers and local authorities with a good plan and, and solid experience you will find some land um, you're not alone don't reinvent the wheel there are loads of organizations doing great work on land access um, and supporting new growers and lobbying lobbying for more opportunities like shared assets um, the environmental land co-op uh, land workers alliance fresh start the soil association land trust etc um, and then having a fair market for your produce is key so look look what's around look at who your who else is out there and and look to cooperate not compete so talk to people right from the beginning if you know where you think you want to be start talking to people before you've even got land because that's probably going to really help you so those were some thoughts that helen wanted to share she's she said that she's very happy to be asked questions by email so i'll put her email into the chat um and yeah, if you've got specifics that you want to get in touch with her about, or if you're interested in Kindling Trust and what they do, do drop her a line. And now I'm going to hand over to Kate um, from Shared Assets. Thanks, Kate. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, right, I'm just going to do the slightly faffy thing of sharing my screen. Okay, if I go like this, and then like this, and then this, and then that. Oh, I'm at the wrong bit of the presentation. I just added in a sneaky slide. Um, so let me go right to the top. You get a sneak preview here. Okay, so hello, welcome. Um, welcome to my kitchen. Um, I am Kate. I'm one of the directors of Shared Assets. Um, we're a social enterprise, um, a think and do tank, which is really a shorthand for saying we do a real mixture of um, consultancy, research work, advocacy, networking, movement building. Um, and we're all about the relationships and solutions that will help make land really work for everybody. And Guy's done a great job of pointing out some of the reasons why it currently doesn't work for everyone. What I'm gonna try and talk, to, talk a bit about today is um, Susie asked me to talk a bit about kind of different ownership models so I'll talk a little bit about that. I've got a few examples and then a little bit on guidance and tools that you might find useful if you're looking to access land. Uh, so um, yeah we are all about common good land use and we want to see um, land being used in the following ways I guess. So I'm not going to read all of these things on this slide but um, I think things to point out particularly here are that um, often when you talk about communities and land and environment people assume you're talking about volunteering but we're very keen and I think CSA is one of these great models of um, looking to see how land use can really provide really sustainable livelihoods for people 
Um, another thing is that, as so it's number six there, that we think there is no way of thinking about a sustainable future economically unless we're thinking about how land is at the heart of that system change. And so we see land as the as the sort of jumping off point and the frame for where we can all work together to co-create a better future. Um, we so yeah, thinking about ownership. Ownership is one of those words that you sort of say it and you think you know what you mean, but then actually you you start digging into it a bit, and there really is no such thing as outright unencumbered ownership of land. Even the queen has to obey certain rules. She can't do exactly what she likes. But really what we're talking about when we talk about ownership is a set of relationships between people or companies and other people or companies and land or things. So it's sort of a three-way contract. And this diagram shows um, uh, the spectrum and the way we describe those relationships is by using the word tenure. Um, and the, what tenure means, tenure is just a way of describing the legal relationship that you have to land. So we have a spectrum basically of tools in this country. Um, and there's some of the main tools listed along the top of this slide. What tool is appropriate for the project that you want to do will depend on the project. Um, and it will depend on how much security and what kind of long term, how, how long term you need something to be. But I think it's important to recognize that there are, um, there are lots of different tools. Most, not all, but most of the alternative or community-led models, particularly when you're starting to talk about land trusts or a lot of social enterprise models will tend to separate out the ownership of the land from the use or the management of the land. So you might actually, as a whole organization, be at different points on this spectrum. Um, but I'll touch on that a bit more in a second. Uh, so, um, a, a few examples. I have, I would have mentioned kindling, um, but I thought Helen was going to be here, so I didn't. I also would have mentioned the ecological land co-op, which um, Susie just touched on, but is mainly, they mainly operate in the south, but they have a great model of buying, using community shares to buy the freehold of, um, to buy the freehold of agricultural freehold ownership of agricultural land and then they go through the pain of getting planning permission to turn it into small holdings which they then rent on to smallholder farmers um, so if anyone wanted to start a similar operation in the north i'm sure that would be a really useful thing um, you probably all heard of ford, ford hall farm i'm sure um, but i think what's really interesting here they're based in shropshire um, the first community owned farm they style themselves as um, but I think one of the interesting things from an ownership point of view here is that the Charitable Community Benefit Society, with its 8,000 members, owns the land and the farmer is the tenant to that society. So you have, like I was saying about this separation between the ownership and the holding of the land in trust and the more commercial operation of the site. And you see this across the kind of social and community enterprise world, whether it's um, like I said, community land trusts and housing or office space, the idea of separating out the, the riskier business elements from the longer term stewardship of some land is often a, often a principle that you see people sticking to. I think it's a good one. Um, a quite a different example, uh, the brilliant guys at Regather in Sheffield, they're a co-op. Um, they have a big vision of wanting to create a mutual local economy um, and they have a 15 acre market garden, which they're building up into a sort of agroforestry operation on the edge of Sheffield, but they're also very active in the center of Sheffield. So again, they, their eggs are spread over a number of baskets, um, but they have a small brewery, they run a veg box scheme, they have a bakery, they have a nice building in Sheffield that people can hire. And so they're operating at a number of levels in the food system. And I think that's again, a really interesting model but it doesn't necessarily have to all be about the farm. The farm can be part of a wider model that is supporting, um, supporting multiple benefits and multiple good outcomes. Um, zooming down to London, just because I thought it was interesting to think, I know this example quite well, uh, and again, thinking about local authority land, um, this is a smallish, but quite substantial by urban terms. Um, X local authority is what, oh, it's the freehold is owned by the London borough, borough of Haringey. 
um, but it's glass house sites. So it's um, under glass growing infrastructure that used to be part of when the council actually grew plants for its own parks. And they also had this nice picture here is um, they had like a, almost a garden center and this was like a mini palm house that people used to go and visit. So it was a fairly urban asset but with a lot of growing space. That's now run by a consortium of three community food enterprises. So a, um, a growing enterprise organically and they also have leases to other um, food growing um, community enterprises on the site. Uh, a distribution uh, organization called Crop Dropped who, who run veg box schemes and then Ubele who run um, all sorts of different projects for the black and African diaspora communities in London. So you've got lots and lots of social purpose things happening on that site but it's primarily a food growing and distribution hub and I think it's a really kind of creative use of ex-local authority infrastructure. And then just to zoom over to Wales because I, I think this is a really interesting project so thinking at a slightly different scale um, and might have some relevance to some of you um, with the ex-industrial towns in the north in particular where this has been a this skyline project has been a feasibility study but it's just got its first bit of actual money to take over some land looking at how what would happen if you gave um, communities in three South Wales Valleys towns, essentially what they're calling the right to the skyline. Currently, the land surrounding most of these towns tends to be owned by natural resources Wales or utility companies. It's often managed as fairly boring commercial forestry, with very, very little interaction with the towns surrounding it. And what they're looking at doing, which has really captured the imagination of a lot of people, is trying to get long leases on that land to manage hundreds of hectares for hundreds of years. And they've been developing up what would primarily forestry, but also some agroforestry businesses look like that would really keep money and jobs and prosperity in those communities. So using the land around the towns to kind of completely reimagine the basis of what it means to live in that place. So it's hugely ambitious, but again, the, the legal mechanisms that all of these people are using are very similar. This will be a long-term lease on some public sector land, but the ambition is absolutely huge. Um, so, uh, you've got a project idea, you kind of know what you want to do, and then you need to find some land. You've had inspiration from all of these wonderful other projects. Um, what Susie was saying that Helen would have said is essentially what I'm about to say right now. Uh, there's a link here to a set of guides on our website uh, that we actually worked on with, with Helen from Kindling Trust and with Organic Lee and with the Ecological Land Co-op. They were all looking for land in various ways and we kind of distilled a whole bunch of lessons over 18 months. Um, and so this is specifically, this guide here is specifically looking at local authorities. Um, but I think a lot of that stands for... Um, uh, private landowners as well, like being clear, working out who you're talking to, offering solutions to people. So trying to find who's got a problem. Is that a problem piece of land? Is that a problem in terms of getting healthy food into their school system? How do you help solve that? I think the thing about proving yourself and then scaling up, as Helen was mentioning, having a reputation is really important. And so if you think back to the rainbow spectrum at the beginning, it might be that, yeah, you need to take a much less secure form of tenure than you would initially like in order to build up a track record and prove yourself and be able to move on to something else. Um, we are also working, we don't have anything properly shareable from this at the moment, but we're working on a European wide project, which is currently um, writing up lessons around Access, innovations around accessing to land, accessing land for agroecological farming across Europe. Um, and some of the really interesting stuff that's coming out there is, it bears some of this out, I think. So one of the things that's really found is that land that is already, it is much easier to find access to land that is already in organic or sustainable production. So if the landowner's already bought into the idea of organic farming, it's gonna be much, much easier to, um, get access to that land for your own project also that it's much easier to find access to lands where the landowners or the current farmers are well networked into local networks and so you yet yeah, like as helen would have said that you're getting that kind of gossip and those leads before things go on the open market but also what that has found again is that uh, um, peri-urban and urban local authority owned land is often some of the easiest to access for agroecological or organic growing projects 
So something to bear in mind when you're thinking about which, um, which hills you want to climb. Um, I'm not going to talk really about the planning system, but do remember that the planning system exists and it's complicated and it's a bit confusing, particularly when you're thinking about um, food growing, particularly when you're thinking about things that might need infrastructure that wouldn't normally be associated with agriculture or forestry or agroforestry. So mentioning, um, yeah, if you're going to have lots of volunteers coming and you're going to need toilets and you're going to need buildings, you may need planning permission for those. And that's, uh, we have some guides, uh, it's complicated, but just don't forget that that is something you need to think about. Um, we also have this website called Land Explorer, which is still in development and still slightly experimental, but it is aiming to, you have to log in and create an account, but it's got an ordnance survey base map and you can um, find out some basic information about land, um, basic characteristics about land. So things like the soil quality, um, also, you can use sort of basic uh, design and mapping tools and then share that with the rest of your group. So it's one of the things that we have realized is that people often don't have access to either GIS technology or any of the WYSI design tools that some of the more professionals might do. And so this is a small attempt to try and bridge that gap. It might be useful. Also, don't forget, there's help out there. CSA Network is great. Um, there's a few more links here. There's lots of other places you could go. As Helen said, don't reinvent the wheel. There are, there are many people who have walked down these paths before you, but every project is different and context is really important. So there's no, um, there's no cookie cutter answers to any of this stuff, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions, do drop me a line. Really looking forward to having a bit of a discussion and that's the end from me. Thanks, Kate. That was great. Um, so uh, yeah this is the chance to ask your questions. So um, probably the easiest way to do it, I don't know if, if all of you can see the hands up button. If you put your hand up, I can then, um, yeah, I'll just ask you to, um, so any questions or thoughts or kind of comments um, that haven't already been in the chat or have been in the chat but haven't been answered. So I don't know if anyone wants to start. I'll just kind of keep scanning up and down and see if anyone's got a hand up. Um, to find the hands up button, you have to click on the participants. Uh, oh yeah, okay. like the little, the little people on the bottom, and then you can see it. Rachel, did you want to? Hi. Yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I've got to talk quietly. Someone's sleeping in the other room. Um, I just saw John's question. And it made me think, because I have been approached by a few farmers who've been asking where, is there people that might want to grow food on my land? How do I get to find, how can I advertise I have land that might be available? Mm. I was wondering like, what is the, like what kind of organizations could you put them in touch with? Or could I put them in touch with to actually get in touch with people that want to grow food mm. and want to grow vegetables or run CSAs? I would certainly, we, we put stuff out in our newsletter. So if, if you send it to us, we can put it out through all our channels. Um, LWA also have a kind of notice board for offers. So jobs, looking for jobs, but also looking for land, but offering land, offering work. So that would be another good place. I'm sure there are more. Um, don't know if any of the other panelists have got thoughts. There used to be a website called Landshare, and it's something we'd love to be able to integrate into Land Explorer, but um, where, yeah, you could have sort of offers and needs and people saying, I want to grow land here, I want to grow food here, and people saying, I have land here, but I, I don't know of anything that does that at a national scale at the moment. Guy might, maybe? No. No, that would be, I mean, that would be really useful. And I, I mean, particularly for CSAs, people are often looking for, five acres it's not very much land so but trying to farmers who might just have a bit of land that they're willing to to see what happens for a couple of years that certainly some of our CSAs are on larger family farms and yeah as Kate said they're generally family farms who are already either farming organically or kind of interested in getting the local community on their land but um yeah, a way of sharing people who are interested like John. I mean, I think it's it's incredible that there's someone there who's, you know, potentially got land and it's not being taken up. So maybe that's something we need to look at. Thanks, Rachel. 
And um, Maddie's just men mentioned um, the Bristol food producers have their land seeker survey. And so, yeah, there are some regional um, good examples of that. Um, yeah. I think the other thing is the farm start network of uh, so people like trained growers who are looking for land. So yeah, that will let LWA manage that. But um, yeah, just recognizing um, somebody just made a point about how actually it can be difficult to get people who reliably use land for, even for domestic growing. So yeah, how do you not get the hobbyists? How, you get, how do you get the people who are gonna stick, stick with it as well? So there needs to be some triaging on both ends, I think. Making sure the landowner is gonna do a decent job of providing the, the land in the right way and making sure that the people taking it on are actually going to be able to manage it. I, do, I just wanted to chip in with a thought. I mean, I, I, very interesting, Sonny put a comment about a national land matching service. And although these are longer shot things if you talk about national policy, but you know, it's worth thinking about these things. Well, it's, it's something Kate and me and Guy are talking about on our project is, is what tools we need. Uh, and what we need national local governments to do. I was just going to comment that, you know, there are interesting things like in, in Ireland, there's a tax break for people who um, let land out to other people. That's been really successful. I came across that the other day. So there could be things done to help this. And a, another just broader comment is the issue of tenure that mentioned Kate. I mean, I think the opportunities to contact farmers may also open out because government is going to be encouraging farmers through giving them lump sums to leave farming and then maybe looking to what happens to their farm. They may want to leave it, but they may want to sit on it and, and let the land. And, and tenure is an interesting idea because I'm, I'm not sure we actually know, we know from Guy's work how own land is owned, but how land is used is a different question. Mm -hmm. Tenure is really interesting. An awful lot of farms probably are already contracted out for big contractors to come in and farm them so you know there may be more opportunities in the future opening up as as, as farming changes thanks graham uh, rachel you still got your hand up uh, i'm not sure whether you wanted to add something else no oh, no um anyone else who would like to talk or ask a question suggest something I guess I'm, I'm from a CSA point of view, I'm kind of interested in, yeah, exa any examples of how, how either individual growers or group, groups of uh, community, groups of people from a local community can access small chunks of land um, and any kind of examples of that that you three have, um, because that's, yeah, it's, I mean, a lot of our CSAs do start on a on a trial basis so they might run 20 shares for a year um, and then the next year develop and part of that first year is is all about kind of showing people sh that they can do it showing both their customers but potentially also the landowner they're renting from that they're serious mm. um yeah i so so it's so we we and and there are meat csas that obviously um need more land but horticultural CSAs can run on very little they do often need quite a lot of infrastructure so polytunnels and storage sheds um, and space for volunteers um, but yeah any thoughts on kind of particular routes that might work for small scale I mean I think from my point of view it's all relationships and um, opportunism and negotiation and um, yeah, like those kind of sizes of land aren't advertised for sale in the same way as bigger ones are, or if they are, they, they're, they're going to go quickly. Um, so yeah, it's, so I know Organic Lee, who are based down the, the Lee Valley in Chingford, um, down, in, down in London, um, have now got a 10 year lease on a ex-local authority glasshouse site, but started off as an allotment and a market stall. Um, or a sort of allotment sized plot with a market stall and then built up the veg box from there <clears throat> and then built up um, uh, lots of relationships with um, uh, like restaurants to supply swanky edible flowers and salad leaves and things. And so, um, and then got a trial period with the local authority and then got a 10 year lease. So yeah, it's sort of step by step by step. But I know they were saying when they were looking for land, they were literally on their bikes, peering over hedges and you know, it is sort of getting to know the area that you're in and trying to find who's using things, looking for what's 
um, what's potentially sort of looks like it might help or looks like it might suit you. Uh, that's one of the reasons we started Land Explorer was to try and make that process a little bit shorter by helping you sort of shortlist sites before you had to get on your bike and go look at them. But um, I'm not sure there's actually still that much substitute for, particularly if you are rooted in a local area and need something that will serve a local community of like going out and knocking on doors and looking over hedges and asking in the pub. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. I, that's, that's, yeah. And I think one of the things we, we would like to kind of do, and I don't know whether it's been done, is just do some case studies, particularly aimed at landowners on kind of how other landowners have mm. let land to tenants, because it, it, one of the, and I mean, Kim, when we were talking mm. about the European work that Kate mentioned, uh, Kim also from Shared Assets was kind of saying that, we, well, we were just discussing the kind of, landowners not knowing what it would be like and being mm. kind of worried that yeah that they're going to get somebody who's going to i don't know start having parties on their land or mm. you know, how do you so having examples from other from peers the the kind of value of peer experience is so yeah. huge um so developing some kind of good case studies on successful um mm. land relationships would be great um mm. I also wanted to ask kind of uh, from from all of our points of view, really, what what are the kind of biggest actions we can all take to, you know, whether whether or not we're looking for land personally um, to kind of. Yeah, encourage encourage away from from, you know, the awful statistics about land ownership and how few people own so much. I mean, what what, what are simple things we can do? I'll chip in. I think Kate made a really important point about building relationships. And I, I think arguably it's quite difficult to know where to go if you're talking to landowners. Who would you talk to? And, and the obvious people to talk to would be the NFU and the CLA. And they have networks of people locally. But I think it's right that, that one thing is to kind of break down the barriers of perceptions um, with what they think you might be trying to achieve. Um, you know, it, but those groups also include horticulturalists and orchard owners and so forth. So it, it may not be as, as difficult as you imagine. And there are some really forward thinking people in NFU and CLA. So, but there's clearly a kind of long standing attitude that, you know, in, in, in the farming community, they say that some smaller farms aren't real farms and, you know, doing agricultural things isn't innovation. You, you need big tech and, and big spending. So I think there's a barrier to overcome there. Um, but I think having, as I said, having really good models around locally will help because, of course, then they'll be known to the local authority and maybe known to those those groups. But obviously bringing those models along and, and having experience so you can talk sensibly about what you're trying to achieve. I do, I do think the points Kate made are really good about getting the experience and being also showing you're a business. Quite often in government, I've, I've sort of fought this battle to say, look, you know, new people coming into farming and growing are business people quite often the whole sort of alternative tag I think can be a bit of a hindrance because people think they're not business people who are trying to make a living and clearly they, they are and you know people in CSAs are and, and yet somehow they're seen as not being the same as other business people I think it's a bit bit crazy really mm -hmm. so, so look I'm a business person I'm a young person or an older person with experience and I bring this to it and I've got a different model but it's a really interesting model and it works I think finish off and before I go on too long, as I said about Rebecca Lawton's work, showing that actually people can make a good income without government funding, probably more than many, many farms are doing, but be careful about how you say that, is actually a really strong point for smaller farmers and growers to make. Um, anyway, and direct selling and working with the community are things that the wider farming industry needs to tap into to make a to make a viable living in the future. So the, you know, there's lots of good things people can bring to that conversation. But engaging with CLA, the NFU, uh, tenant farms association as well might be. A, it may be more tricky with tenants, but any farming body near you to get into those networks would be uh, something I think about doing. Yes, I was just going to add that uh, to what Graham said, just to sort of say to sort of familiarise yourself with what your local authority owns and in terms of land and, you know, if they, if it looks like they're about to sell off land, you know, to try and push for them to not, to not just simply sell off all their assets in a new wave of kind of post-coronavirus sort of austerity measures, um, you know, to kind of make sure that either 
uh, the local authorities retaining that land, if it's, you know, valuable farmland, particularly obviously um, at full county farms, but also, you know, exploring with them if it's possible to kind of set up a, a lease or, you know, other sort of community supported agricultural model with them that, you know, helps them to show. Because I guess also there is that sense, hopefully with local authorities, to some extent, still a greater sense of, uh, of accountability than perhaps say some private landowners in the area to the, to the public and you know that there is obviously a kind of a range of obviously the local authorities are under the caution have you know um financial pressures huge financial pressures and bottom lines to think about but obviously there's also uh at least some degree there that you can persuade a local authority or try to persuade a local authority that this is um delivering on other uh public goods other um public benefits um, and perhaps also um, looking to, I think someone's asking a question about some investment in, in things like ecosystem restoration, obviously looking at what's going on in terms of changes in farm subsidies with you know, the advent of elms and some of the tests and trials that are coming about there and, and what that is potentially able to do um, for, for farms in the future. And I guess, I don't know if um, there's much we can say at this stage, uh, Graham or Kate, about kind of like what might be coming down the line in terms of funding for community uh, for county farms or community farms I don't, think, I don't know if we know the details about that yet but um but yeah i guess in terms of noises that have been made by government about support for, for more financial support for county farms in future and and other uh, co-ops and, and csas um i could come in briefly on that point if i may susie is that useful to carry that on um we've had some conversation with defra there's no announcement we were waiting for a big announcement in september and that's all been pushed back about how this fund might work, the one I was referring to, and, and, and we don't know the size of the fund. I think what we do know is, I, I think what is really good is that the Secretary of State is George Eustace at the moment, and I guess we don't see any um, change in politics, you know, we don't know if politics are gonna change generally, but the Secretary of State, George Eustace, I think, and from what people have said, is, is really quite interested in the idea of incubator farms and peri-urban farming, and is open to the ideas of of smaller scale farms and, and things being done differently in urban areas. Very curiously in the, in the document that published this, there was a bit left um, in February 2020, there was a bit that said peri-urban, which just got left in and should have been cut out. So it was in there originally and then got cut out the last minute. So I think there's still some, you know, I think that is behind the thinking in this and it's a personal thing for the Secretary of State. He's mentioned it in Parliament four or five years ago. I've seen him mention this, uh, you know, in person. And I think it's a bit of his own hobby horse. So I think that's possible. On Elm, um, we, we helped convene a meeting about um, of the Elm group. I'm on the Elm engagement group, which is kind of a bunch of stakeholders who meet DEFRA to develop the new scheme. And, and just briefly, we helped convene um, a workshop on peri-urban and urban land. And, and what we're trying to do is keep open the funding for that kind of land and make sure it just doesn't go to mainstream farming. So I think there's still scope to, for that fund to fund farms and, and certainly working with people like Land Workers Alliance to make sure that funding goes to farms of all sizes and not as it does currently most goes to the largest farms. So I think it's, it is actually positive but it's a slow process and it's still in development so it'll be 2024 when that money starts to flow as a whole scheme but yeah I mean it is developing and, it, and it's looking interesting and has possibilities. Sorry I can't say more about that but it will pay for environmentally good management which means it should be you know organic and csa farms are mostly organic can tap into that because they're doing great things for the soil for biodiversity for water quality and so on um yeah just a couple of things to add to that one is that yeah i think the peri-urban stuff is incredibly exciting and particularly if you live near a place with a green belt being able to do more productive and green things in the green belt than people keeping horses or land banking for future development is definitely um, something that I think is very exciting. Also just to remember that the public sector is much broader than just local authorities. So you, I think thinking, yeah, if you can't find sort of friendly local private farmers um, that maybe um, you need to think about, does the NHS own land? Is there, um, and you know, broader than the public sector, things like the church, church owns a lot of land the um utility companies own lots and lots of land and often lease them to quite sometimes quite interesting forestry businesses and so there might be an interesting thing there but so yeah really thinking about where where are you and who are the main players and the kind of main actors in the land system around you there 
and um yeah looking sort of being quite strategic about where you put your energy i think and who you try and approach i can see uh mick's got a question he's got his hand up hello there i'm uh, mick uh, marston um on the csa at uh, gibside which is a national trust property and uh, I, I want to make a plug um, bearing in mind what was said about how much land the National Trust owns. Uh, the National Trust is really interested um, in supporting this type of activity uh, across its whole estate. Um, I mean we um, and I, I make the plug run because it's um, a very very supportive organization in terms of recognizing the link between the landscape and people and community engagement and the other thing is they're very very used to managing farms because they have a whole raft of farm business tenancies running so we took on a farm business tenancy with them for 25 years it's not ownership but it's a pretty damn good stab at uh, having a pretty long-term thing and the reason that we wanted to go that way is because there's a presumption of continuation. So the whole, the whole security of tenure in a way is kind of helped and it's not as if the national trust can sell any of the land afterwards anyway. So they have a kind of um, commitment. And I think they're also very supportive as an organization and getting the staff behind. You just have to make the approach not all estates have um, suitable land. They're not all in good positions in terms of uh, local community, but there's a hell of a lot that are in semi-urban areas and um, shouldn't say this really, but you know, they're, they're, they're really, really struggling at the moment financially and um, it's a bit like local authorities and they probably would take your hand off if you felt you were going to come along and uh, help them manage some of their estate land. Um, so I get, I get a, a big plug and if you're interested in that sort of route, uh, please get in touch because um, like all bureaucracies, they have their, um, they have their foibles, but they're committed, committed to the CSA model. We have lots and lots of their staff coming to visit and interested in in the model thanks mick um i had a, a question which might be a silly one but i guess um i was talking to somebody the other day about economies of scale but rather than being economies mm. of scale by making larger farms it was economies of scale by much smaller farms coming together to co uh well co-support more land coming into coming into use or to buy together and i just wondered if any of you had kind of good examples of where that works and it made me think of the there was a presentation at the oxford real farming conference earlier this year on regional verts which was a kind of a company that sort of owned, that sort of brought together lots of small scale producers and different businesses under a umbrella of kind of organic stewardship of of the land in I think what was around a county size but just any sort of examples of how yeah how how smaller growers or farmers coming together can kind of create more power to access land. Um, there's a really good example down in Cornwall on the border of Cornwall and Devon called Tamar Grow Local which is a like, yeah, it's sort of an umbrella for lots and lots of small scale producers, often individuals, and they kind of have a honey co-op and um, uh, all sorts of different things, but are really acting at a very systemic level and able to really um, both like advocate for the right kind of local food system, as well as providing really practical support. I think another interesting example is actually what's happening at Wolves Lane, the place I put on the slide. Originally what happened there is the council went to Organic Lee and said, do you want another site? And they said, well, no, that's not how we want to operate. We don't want to just grow and grow and grow. So we'll help create something that will ultimately be independent on another site and we'll use our 
expertise and you know grow some veg there as well but we're not going to create organically mark two somewhere else and so i think that approach of like being much more networked rather than so growing through growing your impact through network rather than scale is a really interesting one I was also going to mention Tomar Grow Local. I, I don't know them very well, but I know that something of the model. I can't think of other ones at the moment. I'm just wondering about growing communities. Kate may know better, but they were trying, they were they obviously working in the Hackney area and they were replicating their model, which is a veg box distribution scheme. But they do uh, represent, they, they bring in um, food from lots of different sites from around the area. And obviously, then they are the sort of front of it and the marketing of it. Um, and they were certainly training people up and, and helping them to replicate that model mm -hmm. elsewhere. And that's Julie Brown and colleagues doing that work. Um, so I thought it may be worth looking into them as well. Um, but I, I'm wondering about how much those schemes might be open to sort of helping, if, if anyone's interested, to just give them a call and ask if they would give them a few minutes to talk through some issues, you know, doing a sort of informal mentoring. I, I don't think people are so busy, it's hard to ask people to do that. But I think. You know, there must be opportunities to go along and talk to them or be involved, join their network or, or find a way to visit them. More difficult under the current circumstances, of course. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I suppose the thing with all of that is being really clear if you do pick up the phone, like what is it you want to know? Mm. And finding out as much as you can from like stuff that's already out there. Yeah. Um, and being, so yeah, you're sort of um, being very uh, respectful of people's time because... Mm wants to support the system right um but yeah focus is good yeah um the, just the, sorry susie go on no 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 go go i was just gonna mention the point that mick made about the land and our sort of trust and sort of linking together what kate and guy said about the other land holdings available so this new fund from the government is not only going to support new entrants in county farms but they are talking about other landowners and I think it's a natural natural jump across should be that it, it, it's an opportunity for organisations like the National Trust, but the Church Commissioners, the Duchy of Cornwall and the Crown Estate to think about how they can open up their land holdings. And I, I don't know enough about this, but I just wonder, given there's a, a real need for more horticulture, there's a real need for more local horticulture and fruit and fruit and food, you know, veg growing to securitise local supply. Um, and that may become quite a dramatic need if, if Brexit goes belly up and, and there are problems at the channel. Um, but I, the, the, the actual value of land let out for horticulture, and you may know, Susie, how much people pay, but I was looking at the figures for county farms and the, the few horticulture examples, the council actually gets a rent of about £800 a hectare for horticulture, but only about 200 to 300 for general farming. So depending on soil quality, but horticulture may be an opportunity for them to see real value in pockets of their estates that, that they're not getting from from standard farming or livestock and so forth so i think it's something we need to look into more as a way of promoting it as, as an opportunity because because councils and other organizations have been said will be looking to make those assets work that's always going to be a consideration um, and, and getting a better return and that needs to be from from good forms of um, farming and growing yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I was just thinking, I mean, I, I'm not sure what Bee's work kind of encompassed on, or Rebecca Lordson's work encompassed on the viability, you know, financial viability of, of small horticultural growers. But yeah, it sounds like there's a, if it hasn't been done already, a bit of work around, um, yeah, around looking at the economics of, of small scale horticultural growers in I mean particularly maybe in peri-urban or urban areas as opposed to larger farms and kind of in in the whole sense of economics so all the different opportunities it brings I mean I'm I'm sure there's stuff out there on it but I don't know if you've got any because yeah it makes it makes sense it absolutely makes sense and maybe you know it's it's hard to work out how how much the strength of kind of large lobbying organizations impacts on our ability to access land and grow on a small scale really. Susie, uh, am I being heard? This Alan Charlton now, sorry I haven't got a picture up. You are being heard Alan, yes, go for it. Okay, so hi Mick, uh, it's a while since I've seen Mick as well, um, brilliant CSA at Gibbside. It's just as a few things, um, 
uh, that's come to mind, and I've, I've put some information up about um, the lessons we learned from um, a bioregional food economy up in Scotland when they had the program around the Fife diet. And th the thing that I was particularly keen on there was that um, farmers and food producers uh, were given um, a guaranteed outlet for their produce so that unlike a CSA where um, the risk is shared right from the outset uh, financially and CSA um, become members, this was an agriculture supported community. Now I know that scheme's finished but I was looking at whether or not the fact that uh, around 75% of local authorities in England have signed um, climate action response plans, emergency plans and so on, as to whether or not we can use those planning tools to refocus that around um, a bioregional economy. So local authorities coming together around say water catchment areas, mapping what's already happening on the land against what would be the key needs of people who live within that water catchment and clearly food is one key element of that. So, so using those local um, opportunities to engage in good practices around building resilience, because that's the thing, I'm retired now, but that's the thing I'm actually working with um, within the Weir Valley area, a bioregional action plan, a new economy. Um, so, and that would be ethical, ecological and regenerative. So it's bringing all of these tools together uh, in a way that helps local people both own the problem and own the solution. Thanks, Alan. Any, I can see guys wanting to talk. Yeah, just on that, I mean, I think, yeah, the kind of passage of so many climate emergency declarations by councils, um, like, you know, councils definitely need to be followed up with on that and held to account and actually made, you know, made to put into place some some policies that that meet those um you know, you know welcome declarations of acknowledgements that there is a climate and ecological emergency going on so I, absolutely and i think obviously the role that lands should play in uh helping us get to net zero and beyond um as quickly as possible as well as um you know restoring lost ecosystems and providing um you know food in a nature friendly way i think is you know all things that local authorities should be um, thinking about more both uh, in the management of their own estates but also in things like local plans and you know under any kind of new local plans that have to be drawn up under under any of these planning reforms we might be facing um so quite soon um and so yeah i mean i think i mean one thing i was just going to share in the chat box is a link to something that um friends of the earth who i work for has been doing recently on looking at local uh, woodland opportunity mapping so obviously that's just you know looking at uh, where there might be most suitable land for establishing new woodlands or growing more trees um, and also looking at agroforestry within that as well although that's uh, harder to obviously um, map it in, in a more comprehensive way but equally a similar kind of exercise could be done with kind of local food opportunity mapping um, and you know looking at kind of areas that are you know obviously high uh, grade agricultural land for kind of you know most fertile soils and stuff like that but also trying to link that up I guess with you know, where local authorities own land or where, where they're supportive uh, landowners to who might, might be a willing to lease land out. Thanks Guy. I mean, I, yeah, I guess I just wanted to add, I think, sort of just for all of us really just talking about food as part of the climate emergency. I was quite a, one local authority that we were talking to around um, a bid to the Climate Action Fund. The sort of initial response was to really sideline food as being important at all in the climate argument and really to focus on transport and energy. And so, and, and then it sort of made me think about, about friends and family who I, who I know think about the climate emergency, but don't necessarily think about short supply chains or what happens to food and the, the yeah, its impact on the environment. So I guess just talking about that, I think talking to everyone you know about it is, is also really important. Yeah, if I can chip in there, I think, I think, Absolutely agree with what you say, Alan. I think there's, that would be wonderful. I think the fact councils have signed up to climate emergency, we did a sort of correlation with them, and looked at the ones that had, and, and look at what they did on actual on peat use. And you think peat use would be a great way to stop, um, by in horticulture would stop affecting the climate, but 
councils are still using it, even though they've signed an emergency action plan. I think the issue, as Guy pointed out, it's what they're actively doing. So challenging the council or, or ex exploring with them what policies they think they're going to do to implement that action plan, rather than it just being a kind of statement that goes out to say we're, we're, we're concerned about it. It's really important. And I think picking what Susie said, I think food, it's an ongoing battle to make and food and land use to make that a bigger part of the climate change picture. It's, it's a complex area. It's not necessarily well understood, I think, in maybe by in people in local authorities. And it's a, it's a battle. And a, the, the Climate Change Committee has obviously produced some really good reports on land use. We might not agree with everything you say, but they do bring food and land use together and food waste. So um, I, I think there's a battle uphill battle to get it embedded in the climate change debate, but it is a very important part of that debate. And I think that will change over the next few years more positively. Can I just quickly respond to Graham there? I've, I've posted up there, although I haven't put the um, web link. Um, I know Kate Roweth, who's uh, an innovative economist mm. uh, who developed the Donut Economics Toolkit. Um, mm. She made that a, a localized tool. Uh, so there's a dashboard um, of economic indicators, uh, which essentially are both planetary and sociological. And it's about challenging your local authority from the point of view of your economic development plan. What does it look like when using this donut economics toolkit? And it's really good then to show with case studies how food and how food is uh, produced and consumed in, in a local area can have a massive impact on what that dashboard looks like. So I'm, mm. I'm just advocating that as one of the things we can do locally, because she's done it in Amsterdam now. They were the first city to take this up. Great. Thank you. I can, we're, we're getting to the end of our time. So I just wanted to, well, say thanks to our three panelists and to Helen, um, who, who passed on some notes, even though she couldn't make it and ask um, each of the three of you just to give a few last words and ask everyone listening if, if you want to put a sort of final comment into the chat, that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, Alan, I can't see anything in the chat from you. I don't know if that's where you're posting it, but I, it's not coming up for me if you're putting stuff in the chat. So I don't know whether you could try again. Ah, uh, there's a, okay, so Maddie's put a um, reference to the donut model. Um, but yeah, so if, if uh, Kate, Graham and Guy, if you've got a last few thoughts on what you've heard and what you want to say and what you want people to remember, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess, yeah, I think really interesting discussion. Thank you, everybody. And I feel like this is one of those real examples of the, um, the need to both be thinking really granular and local and about the viability of your business model and how you are going to get access to a piece of land and also that you're sitting within a much wider system of trying to change the way we do things on a much broader scale and that can be both really exciting and really um uh sort of depressing i think at the same time so i guess i'd just be like i'm always inspired by particularly csas and how um effective they are and I think, yeah, these are the seeds of the future. Like the future is already here. We just need to join it all up a bit and kind of, um, yeah, decommoditize land along the way. Um, but yeah, I just suppose I'd just say thank you everybody for all the hard work that you're doing. And um, yeah, but we've got lots and lots of tools to try and make this work and I'm sure we can do it. <laughs> That's possibly me next. Um, I'd, I'd echo what Kate said. I think there's a really good farming conference called Groundswell. It's a great title because I think actually ensuring there is pressure from the grassroots is really important and great examples from the grassroots of what can work and that resonate in a local area and taking that to local councillors maybe your green councillors you know start with who you think is the most receptive and taking that to your council to change what they do and work locally is really important to sort of harmonize as kate said with what we're trying to do nationally top down if that's the word get the government to change what it doesn't give a steer and a lead and funding to, to make big changes um and i and i think one can get very cynical about changing politics but there are really interesting things happening you have to work with that grain and push it in the right direction and make it really work better 
and, um, and, and, and I think things are changing and views are changing and, so, and, and there's an amazing network of people out there to tap into. So um, uh, all courage to you and all um, power to your elbows, if we put it that way. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've learned a lot from this. I, I don't have any practical experience in um, setting up a CSA or anything like that. So it's been great to hear um, from many more practical examples than, than I, I've been aware of before. And but I guess I would just say two things, which is um, to kind of, if, if you're able to, um, in, in looking for land and, and setting up um, CSAs of your own, you're able to kind of remember the political aspects of this as well and, and do, do maybe two things. Uh, from my perspective one is to to continue to push for greater transparency around land ownership um, and you know if that is, is is just simply getting your local authority to publish better maps of what they own and then that might be really helpful for others in the future who are looking to access uh, local authority land uh, and, and letting councils know that you're interested in that um, and i guess secondly is, is just come back to the point that points that were being raised earlier about um you know gently pressuring local authorities on their uh, responsibilities to tackle the climate emergency and alongside that to you know to make better use of their land for local food growing for you know regenerative agriculture for um, you know agroforestry uh, which sort of you know combining those benefits to people nature and the climate I think is, is really important. Thank you everyone yeah uh, it's, it's been a really great session and and a it feels like a brilliant start this first northern real farming conference so um we're hoping that it'll be face to face next year which would be amazing but um and probably see some of you in oxford in january virtually as well so thanks again to everyone and um i'm gonna end the session now bye thank you bye, bye. 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 bye.